How's it going, everybody? It's Pilot Fam, and we're back for another Deadline ish stream. I'm so sorry that I couldn't be uh, streaming on Monday. So, if you're wondering why there's no VOD over on YouTube on Tuesday, uh, I was a bit busy. Um, I was expecting to play um, uh, in a uh, in a sporting activity uh, on uh, on Monday. Uh, Monday, uh, which would have basically stopped me from uh, streaming, basically. Um, but it got cancelled uh, somewhat last minute, um, so things are kind of jumbled up basically. Uh, and then uh, the last couple of days, I've been busy with a couple other things too. So, but we will cover everything that we were supposed to cover on Monday. We'll do that here today. Plus, we have a bit more info. We got the Champions League draw, bit interesting as well. We could talk about that. Um, we'll obviously talk about how our team did. We'll talk about potential transfers that we're making or have already made. Uh, as well as uh, our predictions and differential picks as we normally do every week. But the title of the stream is Sterling Hole. Everyone trying to desperately bring in Raheem Sterling after his fantastic display versus Luton. Now, it might only be Luton, but the stats have shown that he has been playing a lot better uh, this season as well. So, without further ado, let's get into it. So, that is our team up on the screen for you. We got 41 points. A very poor showing uh, this week. A very hefty uh, red arrow. At the moment, rank doesn't really matter too, too much. Um, again, I will always reiterate, at least for the first uh, several game weeks, probably up until second international break, we did bench boost off the start, so that definitely helped us quite a lot. And it would have been nice to have a bench boost this week because Joachim Anderson got himself 11 points on our bench. Although we might be playing him this week, so that might be good uh, as well. Although the goal was very, very fortuitous, I would say. Um, but all things considered, uh, I, the players that I played, I would have definitely played over everyone else, basically. Um... The only consideration I potentially had was Shaw versus William Saliba, uh, as Saliba had Fulham at home and Shaw had Forrest at home. And when I saw the news that Shaw was injured, well, I was like, well, we're not playing Shaw, so <laughs> we're playing Saliba. And I thought that Anderson would be uh, quite fortunate to come away with anything uh, away to Brentford. Uh, they didn't keep a clean sheet, so I was right on that. Uh, but neither did uh, Arsenal either. Arsenal had a very tough time uh, versus Fulham at home. So all things considered, we I think we played the right player. I think if you run it back, you know, another nine times, I don't think Anderson's scoring in in, in the rest of those games. Um, he was quite fortuitous in the goal that he did score. However, let's run through the team. Johnston, we played him in goal versus Brentford away. It was tough. It was him or Turner, uh, both with tough away fixtures. This was the one where I knew it was going to be close and it was just going to come down to save points, uh, whereas other weeks are more clear-cut, like Turner has Burnley at home this week. Uh, whereas Johnston has um, uh, has Wolves at home. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, Turner has Chelsea away, sorry. Uh, whereas Johnston has Wolves at home. So it's a clear cut of who we should play there. Um, but uh, just a one point in it. Uh, nothing really too much to be said there. Also, um, my support man United. Uh, so <laughs> didn't want to play Turner against him, against United. Um, mind you, I could have doubled down and been like, or like kind of hedged my bets basically. And said, well, if Turner has an absolute worldy and we lose or something and he makes a bunch of saves, well, at least my fantasy team was good. Um, but yeah, just a one point in, so not really too displeased there. Chilwell, clean sheet, six points. James on Planet FPL, shout out to James on Planet FPL, said it perfectly. It was like Chilwell was being controlled by someone playing PlayStation and they just hit X instead of circle. How he doesn't shoot, I will never know. I will never know, but it is what it is. Got himself clean sheet. That's what we uh, what we came for at a bare minimum. Saliba and Stupinian, just the one point. Uh, Matoma and Pedro, just the one point as well. Again, Matt Turner outscoring all three of my Brighton players when they had West Ham at home is not a good look. Um, Del Pedro, we had... Uh, press conference quotes that came out from Deserby after the deadline, uh, which basically said, like... Um, you know, Ferguson was definitely going to play, but he was asked about Joe Pedro and Ferguson. And he said, Ferguson's going to play. The rest is the team or something like that, which basically kind of indicated, yeah, Joe Pedro is not going to start. And he didn't start. Although he came on and did look quite lively. So um, hopefully <laughs> when we need him, um, 
when we need him in a couple weeks' time versus Bournemouth, um, if we still have him by then, uh, then we could potentially uh, utilize him. Because uh, this week, I don't think we're going to be playing him versus Newcastle. Uh, in terms of the midfield, I mean, Phil Foden, apparently he had a, like an upset stomach or something like that. But he came on, got an assist, so we're happy about that. Got us two more points than Slanky, who would have came on for us. Rashford, two assists. Very happy about that. Uh, although Rashford is very highly owned. Saka, eight points. Again, he took the penalty as well. So we're going to possibly see him and uh, Odegaard kind of, uh, you know, flip and flop as to who's going to take pens. Uh, Martinelli with nothing again. Um, that's, you know, not very many points in three games, basically. So he needs to step it up. Otherwise, he could potentially be on the chopping block as well. Erling Haaland missed a penalty, but did score. And if you go off uh, if you go off his uh, record last season, uh, he scored two, then he blanked, then he scored one. The next game he played, he scored three. So uh, if you're thinking about not captaining Erling Haaland this week, um, they are up against uh, Fulham at home, who potentially might be without Paulinho. And the reason being is because Bayern has some interest in Paulinho. The, the player basically wants to leave. Um, if Bayern are interested, um, you know, he has agreed personal terms or at least seemingly, uh, has agreed personal terms. So again, we'll have to wait and see on that one. Overall, pretty meh game week. Um, could have been a lot worse if Mbomo had scored, um, could have been a lot worse um, had Bruno Fernandes got the points he could have gotten last week or the week before as well as the points he got this week um, and been higher ownership. A lot of managers sold Bruno Fernandes. A lot of managers sold Marcus Rashford this week uh, and they were punished uh, quite swiftly, basically. If you went for Madison and you got rid of Rashford, I mean, then you were probably, you were fine. If you sold Bruno for like Foden, then you kind of lost out on some points there. So not the greatest look. However... We move on to our predictions. I apologize for the yawning tonight. I don't know what's gotten into me. A lot of yawning tonight. Hopefully I can drink a bit more water and then uh, that might solve the issue. So, let's pull up the, um, <clears throat> the tweet uh, that I put out for the predictions every week. So... This was our tweet. Um, and in terms of predictions, I think we did pretty decently, all things considered. Um, Chelsea versus Luton, 3-0, uh, predicted exactly right. Uh, so our scoring system is basically if you get the exact score, you get three points. If you get the result right, you get one point, and everything else is zero. So we got three points there. Um, what to say about the game? Sterling was absolutely gliding past players like they weren't even there. Yes, it is Luton, so we'll see if you know slightly increased opposition in Forest or in theory would be Forest. Uh, we'll see how he progresses in that. Um, Jackson as well was fantastic. A lot of movement, uh, a lot of involvement in the play. Never was out of the game. Got himself his goal as well. Um, and it was a poacher's goal too, which is not something we would, uh, have seen Jackson to be. We thought it was going to be more of a kind of, you know, in behind, uh, type, type forward where he just kind of makes the runs in behind. Getting himself in the box was, uh, definitely, uh, uh, and getting a tap in was definitely not something that I was expecting him to do a lot of this season, but he did. And it's fantastic to see a lot of managers are flocking towards him as well. Um, in terms of Luton, I don't think they played all that badly. Um, I just thought just a couple of players on Chelsea were quite good. Malagosta quite fortunate with his two assists, I would say. Sterling did a lot of work for them. Um, so who was the assister on? I think Sterling assisted Jackson and Gusto assisted both of Sterling's goals, if I remember correctly. I could be wrong on that. But uh, yeah, if you played Gusto, cool. If you played, if you didn't play Gusto and you got him off your bench, uh, it's a bit lucky, <laughs> I would say. Um, I just need to check one thing really quickly before we continue. Okay, 
Cool. Um, Spurs versus Bournemouth. I predicted a 3-2 win in favor of Spurs. Uh, we only get just the one point there, uh, mainly due to the fact that we got the score incorrect. I predicted 3-2. Then it being 2-0. Spurs pretty much in control uh, for the first half. Bournemouth having their chances here and there, but nothing too, you know, kind of clear cut. Second half, Spurs get the second goal. Pretty much game's done, and they control it from there. Spurs looking pretty good against teams uh, when it is a bit free-flowing to start with. Not really too much to be said on there, apart from Bournemouth are definitely going to hurt some teams. Uh, once they get into the groove as well. Arsenal Fulham, speaking of teams that are not in the groove, Paulinha comes back into the team and causes Arsenal whole kinds of fits. Uh, Arsenal, uh, up a man, and just can't keep the ball from out the back of the net. They, they're up 2-1, they're up a man, and just like Newcastle, which we'll get onto in a bit, concede a goal. And it causes them to, I don't know, just kind of capitulate, really. Um, I think if Fulham potentially have more time in the game, they might have gone on to get the third goal, if I'm um, uh, being genuine here. Paulinho controlled the midfield basically by himself. Um, and with the Dama Traore as kind of like the counter-attacking player, he's a bit of a cheat code because he's kind of like two players in one because of his size and speed. Um, yeah, really crazy one there. Um, but one Arsenal would like to swiftly forget because they have uh, Man United coming to town this week, uh, which could be a season definer uh, this early on. But uh, we predicted a draw, so we didn't get anything correct there. Brentford Palace, we got wrong as well. Um, thought Brentford would win it quite comfortably. I'm going to have to just run through. I'm just going to have to burn through these yawns, really. Get them all out of the way with And I do apologize. Um, Brentford versus Palace. Uh, end up being 1-1. Uh, no uh, goal involvement from Mbemba or Vissa. Shade's goal was well taken. First goal for the club. And then Anderson's was kind of this fumbly, weird one that just kind of rolled over the line. Bit of a weird one. Um, I think a draw was probably about the right result. Maybe Brentford might have just barely shaded it. Because uh, Brentford at home is going to be... A very difficult fixture for any team. Um, so yeah, it's going to be a bit of an interesting one. Um, Palace are a team where I think we can potentially get some very valuable assets from them. Uh, potentially defensively. Uh, like I said, I currently have Joachim Anderson. Uh, Dean Henderson uh, has been confirmed today to have signed on a permanent move from Manchester United. So he might become the first choice goalkeeper. We'll have to keep an eye on that because I currently have Sam Johnson in my team. I don't think he goes in straight away, um, and I think it's just going to be based on performance, um, and Sam Johnston might look to make a move uh, in January or next summer, potentially, um, if they're going to, or if they're going to go with, like, two competing goalkeepers, or eventually phase out Johnston, and then he goes to a, another club. But currently, Johnston is the England international, so we'll have to wait and see. Uh, we got that one wrong. Uh, Everton Fulham. I think at the last second, or Everton Wolves. Sorry, at the last second, I think I changed it to a one 0 Wolves win, uh, and it paid off. We got three points there. Uh, Wolves and Everton. I mean, Everton have had almost, I think it's five xG um, accumulated and haven't scored yet. Um, they just need someone who could score some goals. Um, I believe they have. I think his name is Beto signed uh, 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 Udinese coming through the door, so maybe that could definitely help them. But uh, yeah, Wolves getting a 1-0 win. I just uh I just don't see how um Everton can stop the rot. They need to score some goals. They've scored zero goals in three games, but they've had the XG to score. Um Kaladzic, happy for him. He got his goal. Um was fouled potentially by Onana, but might not have taken the pen. But got his goal after the terrible ACL injury last season. Um finally got his goal. Everton are in a rough, rough slide. Uh, if Wolves aren't careful, they could be in they could be in that same funk as well. Um, and it might just cause a whole bunch of problems uh, for both teams. But mainly Everton are looking at the staring Sheffield United in the face this week, and it could be massive for both clubs if they were to come away with three points there. Um, 
Yeah, not really much to write home about there. Man United 2-0 over Force end up being 3-2. Four minutes of madness, I would say, is probably the storyline of that game. Uh, Forrest just getting a goal uh, pretty much off the start. Um, just just a weird, weird, weird way to concede. United taking a corner. And then all of a sudden, Awanee is just in on goal, blazing past Rashford. Onana's kind of slipped or done something, making it easier for Awanee, although he's 1v1, so I think he's going to score anyway. And then a cross comes in to Bali, who's just standing in the middle of five United players, and it just kind of hits him and goes <laughs> in the goal, which just makes no sense to me. Uh, but then the class of Bruno Fernandes comes through. Um, the quality... Uh, finally getting some returns for himself, and United bring it back and win 3-2. I would say, if you do have, um, if you do have Rashford, if you do have Bruno Fernandes, again, they can hurt Arsenal in the transition, so don't be surprised if you sold them this week that they couldn't hurt you again. Uh, I may or may not have sold a United player, we'll wait and see. I may or may not have sold an Arsenal player, we'll wait and see. Um, but they can definitely hurt you this week as, especially if Arsenal play the way that they did, United can definitely hurt them on the transition. They just need to be a bit more clinical. And I think that will come with time once they get Hoyland finally, uh, cemented in the team. Then I predicted 4-1 Brighton because they had been winning 4-1 for the first two games. Should have listened to Surge on Planet FBI. I'm sorry, Surge. He said that they were going to win 3-1, and he was exactly right. James also said that West Ham are probably the most uh, suited team to potentially go to Brighton and beat them. And what did he mean by that? The West Ham are very stubborn defensively, very organized. Ariola made like nine saves, um, really frustrated them. And ultimately, Brighton just come away looking you know, all of the ball, all of the possession, and just lose. I mean, War Prowse is going to do you on a set piece because he's just so good. Um, Antonio can hit anyone on the break because he's just an absolute monster. But, I mean, Brighton, you can have all of the ball. It just doesn't mean you're necessarily going to win. And I think West Ham set up correctly. Uh, frustrated Brighton, I think Matoma, he can only dribble past so many players before you could dispossess him. I personally think that... Uh, Maybe Jao Pedro should have started this game um, over. I wouldn't say over Ferguson or Welbeck. I think potentially all three of them could have potentially played. And you could have kind of put them 1v1v1 up against the like the center backs or like the back line. Because playing two strikers, yes, against a back four, you can go 1v1. But it was Welbeck always dropping off and then Ferguson was kind of isolated on his own. Couldn't really get too much involved. He did have his, like, you know, kind of half chance here or there. But uh, there was just so many West Ham bodies in the way that he just couldn't maneuver around. So West Ham, uh, we got that one wrong. Apologies again, Serge. You were correct. I should have known better. Aston Villa and Burnley. Aston Villa winning 3-1 over Burnley. We got that score exactly right. Uh, third score in a row this week. Um, Diaby, again, running the show. Uh, Matty Cash uh, just playing right wing apparently scoring two goals uh, he's flown up in ownership as well Burnley did have a good account for themselves but ultimately Villa just too much excuse me um, Villa just showing how good of a team that they can be even with uh, you know injuries early on in the season to Moreno and Tyrone Mings as well as Buendia, who could be out for the entire season. Man City versus Sheffield United predicted 4 No, It actually was very close. I mean, Pep Guardiola didn't want to play uh, Phil Foden. He was uh, had a bit of a stomach bug, brought him on, got himself the assist. Uh, Kyle Walker with a moment of madness, kind of. Not really sure what to say there. Um, could they have dealt with it after Kyle Walker made the error? Yes, but Kyle Walker shouldn't be trying to backheel it in his own box. Not really sure what he's doing there. But City kind of just turned up the pressure, got the goal, and then ended up getting three points, as you would expect that they would do. They did have a fair few set of chances uh, before Sheffield United scored. Um, you know, Holland misses a penalty. Uh, Julian Alvarez um, 
had chances. Holland had more chances as well. Um, you know, they did have their fair few. Um, and City would have, would have definitely come away scratching their heads if they had gotten a point or even less. Newcastle, Liverpool. Now, it looked like it was going to be a pretty smooth sailing victory for Newcastle. Trent Alexander-Arnold uh, getting booked after throwing the ball away. Although, I will say, he was 100% fouled by Gordon. Um, and then he got frustrated, uh, rightfully so, because he thought that he should have got a, a foul. Threw the ball away, got a yellow. Then proceeded to forearm uh, Gordon in the face, which is, if he had, hadn't been booked, he would have been booked again. So he probably should have been sent off. Um, Virgil van Dijk, I think 100%. It's a red card because Isak is in on goal if he doesn't. And he goes straight through him. He goes straight through him. He takes the man straight out. Um before he even touches the ball. Um, in terms of this, uh, the penalty for Manchester United, I think that's 100% a, a penalty, or a, 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 not a penalty. It's a, it's a red card as well. This was a more a bit more obvious. He doesn't play the ball at all um, and just pulls down Bruno. Bruno's definitely getting there before Bali and Matt Turner. However, I do think that in both instances, if the referee would have given a yellow card for both, um, both sides, I think they would have probably still sent the official over to the monitor to have a look regardless. Um, but doing the red card uh, for both uh, both games, they wouldn't have overturned it regardless. So Because they would have seen this contact. Also, Marcus Rashford, I wasn't saying that he dove and whatnot. Now, I'm a United fan, but I'm going to see it objectively. Rashford goes past Danilo, and there is an angle from the back that clearly shows Danilo puts his knee in. It clashes with Rashford, who's at high pace. And he takes him down. It may look soft, but I don't know if you've seen Marcus Rashford, but he's uh, he's very fast. So when you go that fast, it doesn't take much for a player to actually get off balance and, and go over. Um, so it's 100% a penalty. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, and then you also have the City penalty. Again, it was a handball. Very similar to the situation uh, with Sergio, uh, not Sergio Romero, uh, Christian Romero of Spurs for United. Again, both similar situations where the player's kind of sliding. Um, it's a handball in both instances. One was given, one wasn't. Not really sure what else to say there. But back to the Newcastle-Liverpool. Uh, we got this one wrong. Uh, Newcastle looked like they were going to be cruising up a man, up a goal. Gordon had Trent on strings. And then Darwin Nunez comes on, creates the chaos, and just goes absolutely crazy scoring two and getting Liverpool three points. Just a crazy, crazy game, that one. That was probably the most... Um, I would say probably the most enjoyable game I watched as a neutral. Uh, obviously, I enjoyed United coming back. That was that was great, um, but shouldn't have been down two 0 in the first place. That probably irritated me more. But yeah, that game was great. A very good game to end all of the week. Um, in terms of our differential picks, I mean, clean sheet Wolves kept themselves a clean sheet. Uh, Flecken. Uh, I believe got himself a, a bonus point. He did. He made four saves, so he would have got four points, which is above average. Uh, so I would take that as a differential pick. Uh, Udogi got himself uh, an assist, kept himself a clean sheet, uh, got himself bonus points, I believe, as well. Yep, got himself three bonus points. Raheem Sterling. I mean, what a week to pick Raheem Sterling as a differential absolutely crazy uh, and then Aketi as well got himself uh got himself on the score sheet um as to why Arteta didn't play him from the start I have no idea he's now scored two goals and an assist in the first three games if he doesn't play versus United I don't know what Arteta's doing uh but five out of five in the differentials which is uh not something that happens very often so um points wise we got what's that three four five six 9, 12 points, so a really good week for predictions, uh, and definitely a good week for differential picks. So we shall write that down. Right, let's move into the picks for this week. Let's move the tweet out of the way bring up the notepad now 
Luton versus West Ham tomorrow evening. West Ham have been conceding a goal every game, but they've been tight defensively. Luton have created some chances, but haven't been able to score, you know, absolute bucket loads. I think West Ham win this one. Uh, I'm going to go with a classic West Ham 2-0 win in this one. Sheffield United and Everton. Now, this is a game uh, where both teams need at least a, uh, I mean, a point probably does eat either them no good. They need three points each, which is why I think it's probably just going to end up being 1-1. Both teams can't score. But I can't predict a 0-0, can I? I'm certainly not going to be watching that game. It's probably going to be extremely boring. That being said, it's probably going to be the game of the week after I've said that. Uh, Brentford Bournemouth, I expect this one to have uh, fireworks in it. Um, I expect Brentford um, to um, to play well in this one. Bournemouth will put up a fight, uh, but I expect Brentford to uh, to win out. I'm going to go with a two one in favor of Brentford. Uh, Burnley very front foot, uh, and it showed against Aston Villa that what can happen. So I think that will be a similar situation. I'm going to go with Spurs. Uh, winning 3-1 over Burnley. And I think Spurs will do the exact same thing that they did to Bournemouth as they did to Burnley. Although Burnley, I think, potentially have a bit more firepower in them right now uh, as they are currently. Chelsea versus Forest. I think this is a pretty straightforward win. For Chelsea, I'm going to go with a similar scoreline. I'm going to go with 3-0 uh, as they were over Luton. Man City and Fulham. I think this should be a straightforward win for Man City. Um, I think with Paulinho in there, it does help Fulham out a lot, although he might not necessarily be uh, involved uh, for Fulham on the weekend if he is kind of finalizing the details of a potential deal to Bayern Munich uh, as there's interest there. So uh, with or without Paulinho, I think Man City will win comfortably at home. Man City haven't been scoring an absolute boatload, uh, but if Paulinho wasn't there, this score could be anything. Uh, but I'm going to go with a comfortable 2-0 uh, win in favor of Manchester City. Brighton, Newcastle, a team that can set up stubbornly defensively, can show that they can beat Brighton, uh, which is why I'm actually going to favor uh, Newcastle here. I think they'll potentially learn from their mistakes defensively uh, and go to uh, go to Brighton and give them a good go. I'm going to go with 2-1 in favor of Newcastle. Crystal Palace Wolves, I think Palace defensively are quite solid. Uh, Wolves have scored... Uh, not many goals, basically. They scored one last week. Uh, who'd they play in week two? Brighton, and they scored one then. So, if anything, they, they might score one if they're lucky. Uh, but I think Palace defense have been so good. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Palace winning 1-0. Also, Palace are at home, which helps them out massively. Uh, Wolves, I believe, have uh, scored four away goals, or won four away games. Um, in their past, like three seasons or something like that, or so it's not it's not very good a good record, uh, basically. Um, and three of those have been against like Everton or something like that. It's it's crazy. Uh, Liverpool Aston Villa. This could be a very feisty game. Uh, no Virgil Van Dijk definitely hurts Liverpool, or does it? They looked a lot better when they actually were down to ten men. Uh, I'm going to give Liverpool the edge here, but I'm going to go with a very uh, attack minded game. I'm going to go three two. Uh, and then Arsenal, Man United, I mean, Arsenal are definitely favorites here. Uh, they are at home. Both teams aren't playing as good as what they would probably expect um, in this one. I think defensively, in terms of midfield solidity, I think Arsenal definitely have the edge in terms of ball retention. Um, and I think it could cause Man United some problems as they aren't fully switched on at the like from midfield and at the back in terms of space orientation um, for like the distance between the midfield and the defensive line. Um, Arsenal can definitely play through a press. They are very good at that. So I'm going to go with Arsenal uh, win, unfortunately, 2-1. Uh, In terms of our clean sheet and differential picks, I've gone with West Ham to keep a clean sheet this week. I've gone with Vicario uh, as the goalkeeper uh, this week uh, because he's going to get a bunch of uh, potential save points, and he might keep a Brentford 2-0. Um, which would be uh, good if you're going for him. I see he might go up in price tonight too. I've gone with Emerson uh, at West Ham. Uh, just looks to be quite good in that left-back position. Does get forward a decent bit. I've gone with Dan Juma of Everton as our midfield differential pick this week. Uh, Scott on the score sheet, I believe, in midweek in second round of Carabao Cup. 
Uh, so 0.2%, I think he's 5.5 .5 or 5.4 million, could be quite good as well. And then Austin Edwards, someone who if you wanted to replace Jal Pedro right now, is someone that you could potentially do it with and rotate him in and out as you please. Again, 2.1%. Uh, did score in the opening week and potentially could get some more versus Wolves this weekend. So that is our clean sheet and differential picks. Now, before we before we go over to the. Uh, before we go over to our team, we are, in a second, uh, going to bring up FPL.team. And I'm going to show you my reasoning because I have made some moves already. I'm just posting our uh, predictions, differential picks, and stuff like that. Uh, for this week so if you're watching this over on youtube they would have been out by now just go check my uh twitter or x or whatever it's called now um Ansu Fati is going to be a Brighton player, as we know. Um, and United are also bringing in Sergio Reguilón on loan. As they were potentially looking at um, at um, Mark Kukurea, but uh, the loan fee was too high. So this is our um, our team uh, before we made our transfers. Now, if we look at our team, we had two free transfers. We have 0.5 million in the bank. Now, what are the problems currently with uh, with the team? Well, we kind of wanted to air out kind of some of the arsenal and united players as they do play each other this week uh united then have brighton at home which isn't the greatest fixture after the international break um arsenal still have uh you know three good fixtures in my mind spurs from an attacking point of view is still good everton is always going to be a good fixture as is bournemouth whereas united uh brighton is always going to be difficult burnley away is potentially difficult united just don't seem to do well uh against burnley in general Palace is going to be stubborn. Brentford is going to be stubborn. And then maybe the Sheffield United fixture with Fulham, Luton, and Everton could be a little bit easier. But we can always get rid of Phil Foden around that time. Uh, because after game week seven, we can get rid of him. Because then he plays Arsenal, Brighton, Man United, and so on and so forth. Um, same with Brighton. We could potentially offload slash bench some of them. Sejal Pedro again. Uh, Newcastle and Man United in the next two. Doesn't seem to be starting every week either. Um, so one of the changes uh, we made straight away um, was we got rid of uh, um, Luke Shaw was for one uh, because he's injured. Uh, and we brought in uh, Kieran Tripp here. Uh, and he was actually our third transfer. So our other two transfers was uh, we wanted to get rid of Dominic Solanke uh, because we wanted to bring in Nicholas Jackson, uh, who looked fantastic. And we could play him over Jao Pedro this week. But we didn't stop there. We actually got rid of Rashford as well, and hopefully this is kind of like an omen potentially uh, so that United can play better and beat Arsenal. Um, if United lose and I have Martinelli and Saka on my team, hopefully they give me some FPL points. But if we win and they don't do anything, then good. That means United won, so that's kind of good. Uh, but we then brought in Raheem Sterling as well. So we took that for minus four. So that was uh, Dominic uh, Solanke, Marcus Rashford, uh, and the injured Luke Shaw out for Karen Trippier, who we're going to want for later on. Uh, Sterling, who has a good run now. Uh, we're going to have him for quite a while. Same with Jackson, who looks really well. Uh, or really good, sorry. Um, and then the last change in the team is we put in Anderson over Saliba. Move Trippier up. Um, and that's the team currently as it stands. Holland's the captain. 
uh, with, uh, I think I have like Jackson or whoever is vice captain. Um, so the seems pretty solid. So we got Johnson and, um, and Anderson in goal with Chilwell, Sterling and Jackson home to Forest. A couple of Brighton players to hopefully get something versus Newcastle. Um, Arsenal, two Arsenal players. I mean, if United win 3-2 and Martinelli and Saka get two goals and two assists each, or uh, they like Martinelli gets two goals and Saka gets two assists, but United wins 3-2, I don't care. <laughs> um, so um, Holland's the captain, Jackson vice captain. Um, but if you look at further weeks down the line, uh, we also got in Sterling before he went up to 7.1 as well. Um, and he's now since which gone up to 7.2. Jackson, we had to wait a day uh, because um, he hadn't played yet um, on the Friday. Uh, he went up 0.1 before we got him in. And then we got him in afterwards. So we look after the international break. Um, we can play Trippier over Anderson. Villa way is a bit trickier. Um, potentially we could play Saliba away at Everton uh instead but i think trippier at home to brentford is probably better turner comes in as well um the brighton boys again it's just going to be tough i think from an attacking point of view i think brighton away to manual isn't bad um so again we would play them no transfer needed to be made unless there was some injury over the international break uh game week six um we could potentially get rid of uh we could potentially get rid of um, of Saliba because we might not need him anymore. Um, what else did I have on my notepad? Um, in game week six, I had um, I actually had Jao Pedro going to um, to Archer because if he's still not playing at that point, then it's time to get rid of him. Um, getting rid of Arsenal players at home to Spurs is just crazy. Um, so I would just get rid of uh, potentially Jao Pedro go to Archer. Uh, we would then put uh, Anderson up. Eh, we'll probably put Archer ahead of Saliba, I would say. And then Johnston plays over Turner for sure. Um, if the Johnston situation is, you know, kind of a bit of a crazy one, um, then we would uh, also change the goalkeeper here as well. Um, and it would just be Johnston to another 4.5. I mean, like uh, Flecken as an example. Um you know, still has great fixtures from game week six onwards. And it's just a solid goalkeeper. I mean, he looks like Raya Mark II, uh, as it currently stands. Uh, in game seven, Foden um, away to Wolves. Um, this is where we could potentially get rid of him. Bring Rashford back, who has Crystal Palace at home, which I think is a good fixture for him. Wolves away, again, Foden could be... This is where like Doku and players like that could already be integrated, which could be causing him problems. Um, Saliba, I mean, Bournemouth at home, potentially looking to play him here. But I think, you know, it is a bit tricky. Turner, home to Brentford, probably throw him in there. Um, and then in game week eight, uh, probably looking to get rid of Martinelli um, and bring in James Madison. Uh, we could potentially go for Richarlison as well if we wanted to. Um, Joachim Anderson probably comes in versus Forrest at home. Maybe. Maybe this will make another transfer here um, in game week eight. Uh, what is the fixtures? Uh, maybe this is where we bring in Diaby, who has good fixtures. So maybe it's Matoma, um, who, yes, he has City, and then Fulham, Everton. But we could potentially get rid of Sterling after at that point. Uh, maybe this is where we go Matoma to uh, Diaby. But like I said, if the, you know, if the, and then we can go like Jackson afterwards in game week nine um, to, to Watkins as an example. Uh, we would need to free up a little bit more money and we'd have to work it out that way. Um, but we would get, you know, that'd be closer to the time. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the plan as it stands. Uh, Trippier would be in for a very good run for pretty much until game week 20 really i mean spurs away fine man united and chelsea at home i mean united doesn't score very many goals um chelsea can score goals but again still quite fine arsenal at home you know I, anytime newcastle play at home i would back them basically um although they did slip up versus um uh, versus liverpool so that is a bit of an issue for them just a bit of an issue. 
Um, so yeah, that's what the team looks like. Got it all nicely laid out. So that's going to be the team uh, for this week. Um, and yeah, we'll have to wait and see. Hopefully I can roll in game week five. That'd be great if we can. Uh, but again, we might have to change the goalkeeper. Um, I don't expect Dean Henderson to come in this week. Um, it would be weeks after that. That would be the issue. Excuse me. That would be where the issue potentially could arise. So we'll have to wait and see. But like I said, Flecking could come straight in. I mean, Brentford's fixtures, uh, Brentford's fixture in game week five. Newcastle way is tough, but hope for some save points. Um, then Brentford are, have Everton at home, which is great. Um, Forced away. I mean, Flecken's going to do well in those fixtures. Um, so again, just one to kind of keep an eye on. Um, at the moment let's also take a look at the champions league draw so because this is quite important um for upcoming uh fixtures because the champions league fixtures will commence uh post game week five i want to say um let's see where did i put it Remember, there's a graphic posted. Uh, I think it was Fabrizio who posted a nice graphic. Oh, here we go. Here's a nice graphic. Put this up on the screen here. We'll just make this a bit, uh, a bit smaller so we can all see it. Um, so those are all the groups there. It just says up the top. It says UCL group stage draw results. Um, so why is this important? So uh, groups that we can basically ignore. Well, we can ignore group E. Uh, we can ignore uh, group H. Uh, we can ignore group D. And we can ignore group C. The only groups that matter are the teams with Premier League teams in them. And that's group G, group B, um, group F, and group A. So let's start off with uh, Group A. Group A has Bayern Munich, Manchester United, Copenhagen, and Galatasaray. Now, in terms of travel schedule, uh, not the worst. Um, you know, uh, I think Turkey is probably the furthest um, that in, that United will have to go. So whenever the Galatasaray away game is, that could be a bit of a you know kind of a, a jet laggy kind of affair. Galatasaray, very passionate fans, um, tough away ground. Um, so. That could be a bit of an interesting one, but from the rest of them, uh, Copenhagen and Bayern Munich, fairly straightforward uh, European ties there. In terms of travel, in terms of difficulty, I think Bayern Munich will be obviously the most difficult. Uh, I expect them to probably win the group. Uh, the amount of firepower that they have in their team now with Harry Kane is quite scary. Um, but I expect United to go through in this group, all things considered, which will mean uh, come February, uh, they will have more Champions League fixtures to go, uh, which means more fixtures uh, later on for United um, in the season. Um, so all things considered, if United have an away fixture versus Galatasaray um, or Bayern Munich, that could put some quite heavy uh, demand on them. Um, all things considered, I think the schedule should be fairly comfortable um, in terms of travel. Uh, Arsenal, uh, Group B, uh, one of the uh, four Premier League teams in the Champions League. Arsenal back in the Champions League for the very first time in quite a while, actually. Uh, they have Sevilla. Again, a quick hop over to Spain. But again, Sevilla away is a very tough fixture. 
uh, lens should be fairly straightforward and PSV uh, Dutch side uh, again should be a fairly straightforward tie so really it's only the Sevilla fixtures that could put a lot of pressure on them Sevilla like to make a lot of challenges they like to commit a lot of fouls um, they're also a team that is very stubborn and could front uh, frustrate you both physically and mentally um, so that would be interesting to see where those fixtures are put as well but all things considered again should be a fairly straightforward group where Arsenal should uh, potentially come at worst second in that group We'll hop on over to Man City's group in Group G. Uh, they have RB Leipzig, who they seem to get every year. Um, FK Cervenia Zvedzada. I think that's uh, basically uh, Red Star Belgrade, basically, uh, is the translation for that. Uh, and then Team uh, Young Boys as well. Uh, United had them, I believe, in the Champions League or the Europa League uh, a few seasons ago. Um, this group is very straightforward. Uh, very, very straightforward. In terms of travel, I don't think it really matters for Man City. Yes, it is quite long, uh, uh, much longer travel uh, to the likes of uh, Red Star, Belgrade. Um, but I think all things considered, Man City could play their B team against all, f all three of these teams and comfortably win. Um, they have the easiest group, I would say, by far of any team. Uh, there is potentially arguments to say uh, that Inter Milan's group is easiest, but I would say Benfica, Salzburg, Sociedad are all better teams than the likes of Red Star, Belgrade, and Young Boys. So I think Man City can comfortably walk this group no problem, and I don't think they're going to exert very much stress on this group at all. Now the stressful group. We got Group F, which has Paris Saint-Germain, Borussia Dortmund, AC Milan, and Newcastle United. Now, Newcastle, in terms of uh, travel time, uh, Germany, uh, Italy, and France, all very manageable uh, for English teams. However, the San Siro, uh, the Parc de France, and I can't remember uh, Dortmund's uh, Dortmund Stadium, actually. Let me, let me check. Dortmund Stadium. I know it has some fancy name. What's it called? Signal... Iduna Park? Is that it? I guess. The Westphalia Stadium? Sure. Um, but yeah, those away, like the Paris away fixture is going to be tough. The AC Milan one's going to be even tougher, and the Dortmund one is going to be the toughest, I think, in terms of just, just sheer noise. Um, Newcastle do have quite an advantage in terms of their home. Uh, their home ground being quite good. Um, so, but it's going to be tough opposition every time they go to kick a ball in the Champions League for six games straight. So it is going to be quite difficult for them. Um, and I can see that putting a lot of stress on their squad. Um, they do have a good starting 11. It's just what could happen with them um, come the weekend. And I think potentially if they have easier opposition, we might see early rotations or early substitutions which could actually help out certain players so likes of kieran trip here i think he's good enough to 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 get early which is what i've done uh, he can go play versus psg play versus storm and play versus ac milan and then you play him for 60 minutes and comfortably be whoever you are in the premier league because newcastle are pretty good um but if they do have a tough fixture so like if we go back to if we go back to um to newcastle if let's say come you know come November, uh, one of those fixtures is sandwiched in between Wolves away, which is tough, and Arsenal at home, that could pose a problem. Uh, but for the earlier part, um, I think they should be mostly fine, um, no matter what the schedule is. But uh, yeah, they would definitely have the most stress in terms of who their opposition is um, on a week-to-week -week basis for the Champions League. So. Um, and I believe three fixtures are done before the first, uh, the second international break, and three are done after, something like that. Anyway, but yeah, just a bit of an just interesting to see the um, Champions League groups. I would say, out of all the teams in uh, the Champions League that are from the Premier League, Man City definitely has the easiest group. Um, I would say Arsenal's group is deceptive, um, but I would say definitely should be coming out of that on top uh united's group again is deceptive with a slightly harder opponent uh in bayern munich so i think united could come second in that group i think arsenal have a better chance of coming first in their group than united do uh, and then in newcastle i mean they could finish anywhere from 
fourth to first, to be honest. Because PSG can kind of fold over one game. Dortmund can easily concede. And AC Milan could kind of just park the bus and just kind of concede one. And then might not score or something. I, I don't know. Newcastle could definitely do well in this group. They could also get absolutely smashed. Um, <laughs> but uh, the last thing that you want from Newcastle probably would be to come third in this group. I think I predicted them to actually win the Europa League. So I need them to come third uh, if they're going to do that. Um but uh yeah that would mean a lot more games for them as well but uh yeah man city definitely getting the easiest draw by far so this is the team up on the screen in terms of value what we have left in the bank uh, we got sterling uh before he was um if we just take a look here um we got Saliba obviously when he was five, Stupinian when he was five, Cho when he was five five, Anderson when he was four five, Trippier bottom he's six five. Martinelli hasn't changed. Saka's gone up twice. Matoma's just gone up just the one. Sterling we got him before both price rises. Foden we got him before his price rise. Um, Jao Pedro stayed the same. I think he's gone up and then back down. Jackson we got him uh, just after his price rise because he hasn't played yet. And Holland has yet to go up in price. Uh, what is our team value anyway? Does it say? 100.6 plus 0.8, which is 101.4, uh, I want to say. But uh, yeah, that's the team. Uh, that is the team. So we've got Johnston in goal with Anderson to back him up for a double, hopefully clean sheet by Crystal Palace. Uh, Stupinian and Ben Chilwell with Matoma, Foden, Martinelli and Saka, Raheem Sterling with Jackson and Erling Haaland uh, as our captain with Pedro Trippier later to be used and Saliba on our bench and Matt Turner as our backup goalkeeper. Hopefully Johnson plays this week. That'd be great. Um, I don't, I just don't see Dean Henderson starting over. Maybe after the international break, there's a chance and we will address that when, uh, when that does probably inevitably happen, I think. But currently as it stands, Johnson is one of the England goalkeepers um, that was picked. Uh, actually, just before we do sign off, I'm actually going to um, let me bring up the, the England team that Gareth Southgate, uh, Gareth Southgate picked because it's an absolute fiesta, basically, um, who he selected. Uh, let me see if I can. Uh, how am I going to do this? This is going to work. Let's see. Yeah, so that's it there. Let me see if I can make this a little bigger. All right, there we go. So that's the England squad he selected. In terms of goalkeepers, pick Sam Johnston, Jordan Pickford, and Aaron Ramsdale. I mean, you can't say that Nick Pope's done better than Jordan Pickford, but he's going to pick Jordan Pickford anyway because he's done well for England. That's a big theme in this one. Ben Chilwell, perfectly fine. Levi Colwell, potentially injured. We'll have to wait and see. Lewis Stonk, I really like that. I think that's a very good pick. Mark Gahey, again, great pick. Harry Maguire. Um, um, zero. Um, uh, zero and... Uh, oh, right, zero. Uh, he's played zero minutes. Zero. Right. Interesting. Uh, Fikayo Tomori. Again, fantastic pick. Should have been being picked all along. Um, I'm really liking the young the young players coming through at center back as well. Um, I think John Stones would have been picked. Um, and Tomori probably would have been left at home. Uh, but I think Stones is still injured. Karen Trippier. I mean, yeah, you're going to pick Trippier. Kyle Walker. I think he's perfectly fine. Trent Alexander-Arnold being picked as a midfielder. Interesting. Um... Although I don't think he potentially deserves to be picked. Uh, Jude Bellingham, he's best England's best player, arguably. Connor Gallagher, I think Gallagher's played okay. Uh, Jordan Henderson. Hmm. Doesn't play in the Prem anymore. Also kind of, uh, kind of took his, uh, his uh, certain colored laces and probably threw those away. Uh, Calvin Phillips. Um, uh, zero, yeah, um, a uh, zero, and, uh, oh, yes, uh, another zero. Uh, 
we'll talk about that more in a second. Declan Rice. It's Declan Rice. I think he's good. Eze. I think he's uh, done pretty good. Phil Foden. Yep. Jack Grealish. Yep. Harry Kane. Yep. James Madison. Yep. Eddie Nketia. Good on him. Um, for getting a call up there. Uh, Marcus Rashford. Yep. Bakaya Saka. Yep. Callum Wilson. Yep. I think those are all perfectly fine. I think those are all perfectly fine for the... Uh, for the England squad. Um, one player that I would probably say um, that should have been called up uh, for sure uh, would have been um, Rico Henry. Not sure why he wasn't. Makes no sense to me. Um, another player potentially is Aaron Wambasaka. I don't know if he's changed his um, his allegiance or not, but I think Aaron Wambasaka deserves to be called up as well because he's been playing well as well. Southgate said that he was going to pick players on merit. He was going to pick players on who are playing well. Well, Gareth, how do you know if they're playing well if they haven't played? Calvin Phillips has been rooted to Man City's bench. Harry Maguire is like 16th choice center back. How are you going to pick these players? I genuinely don't understand. It basically sets this precedent that Harry Maguire could not play a single minute for Man United and still get picked for England. That's what it shows. That's what it shows. Will Harry Maguire play games for Man United this season? Potentially. Do I want him to see him playing games for Man United this season? Nope. Because I think he could go to West Ham and be brilliant. He could be he could make West Ham even better than what they are. James Ward Prowse crossing the ball into Harry Maguire. Maybe then, maybe then, then Southgate will figure out James Ward Prowse is a good player and deserves to be in the squad. Again, should have been picked over Calvin Phillips. Um, also, Jared Bowen. Why hasn't Jared Bowen been picked? Who knows? Who knows? Jared Bowen's been brilliant at the start of the season. Why hasn't he been picked? Who knows? Nobody knows. Nobody understands. What's Grealish done to get picked? I think he had one. I think he's had an assist, but for the most part, he doesn't really do anything in city games. Also, he's probably still drunk, <laughs> with the amount that he was drinking uh, during their their parading and stuff. But yeah, I mean, it just sets a precedent where it just be, basically becomes like a boys' club, and that just is a bad example for for young players out there that think they have a chance of getting in the English squad when they have no chance because they have players going off and taking taking the money, uh, going to uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, which I mean, if you want it, that's something you want to do. Good on you. Um, uh, or players, the, the one that irritates me more so than that, because I think it's perfectly fine to go get a better wage if you want to play football. Still, that's perfectly fine. But players that are not playing at all, like Calvin Phillips and Harry Maguire, and you have players in their position, like James Ward-Prowse in particular, for Calvin Phillips's play uh, position, that just are getting picked and James Ward Prowse has left home after he's played well in the championship for the first couple of games, then gone to West Ham and just made them absolutely smash Brighton. So I just don't understand. Uh, but that's my rant over. <laughs> if you're watching this on YouTube, um, it's probably about 15 minutes or so uh, until the FPL deadline. So make sure you have your teams locked in. Uh, you know what my team is already, but I will post it over on Twitter. Uh, just before the deadline or when the deadline passes uh but this is going to be the team uh as well uh, before we sign off let's talk about our sponsor for the video so fantasy football scout have kindly uh teamed up with us again this season make sure to check them out in the description down below fantasy football scout is a fantastic members area we can get all kinds of articles uh as well as uh, different tools in the members area which includes tables powered by opta player comparison tools, heat maps, and much, much more. They're fantastic. FantasyFootballScout.co.uk. Make sure you go check them out, or you can use the link in the description if you want to help us out uh, and get your membership through that as well. The home of uh, Fantasy Football, make sure to check them out. Now, let's move over to the big screen. Thank you all for watching this, not the deadline slash deadline-ish kind of stream. Uh, hopefully, I was able to answer your questions in the chat. Again, this is a VOD. Remember, it is a VOD. 
if it has deadline ish in the title it is a bod it also says live stream bod as well so make sure to pay attention to that um all the streams are done over on twitch uh maybe i'll transition over to youtube at some point but now is not that time so thank you all for watching make sure to like comment subscribe follow us on all the socials pilot flame 226 on all platforms until next one take care